don't know how long this is going to be. I want to say short, but usually when you say short, it goes long. So maybe if I say long, it'll go short. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Amen. You may be seated. We talked about the Gentiles. We talked about the uh, last time I, I taught on this chapter that we were looking at the visions of Peter and, and how that it wasn't just about a dietary law. There was so much more that was involved in, in this, uh, this passage. And, and really this passage right here is a key for you and I. And so if we look in, in a time frame from the time of, the, of Pentecost in Acts 2.38 to this time is about nine years. So there's nine years worth of separation. So a lot of times I think we, we read the Bible and we go, okay, well, that's chapter 9. So it just happened maybe a couple days ago or maybe a couple weeks ago. But this is a nine-year period from the time of, of the first outpouring of, of the Holy Ghost to this, to this point here. And so when we look at this, Peter is really beginning to make a separation. What he's making a separation is he's realizing there is no difference. The same God that he was raised to, to, to love and to obey is the same God that poured out his spirit. The same God that as a child he was calling Jehovah is the same God that he now calls Jesus. But he's, re he's saying there that, that, that man, no matter who you are, whether you're Jew, Gentile, we're all judged by the same God. And, and we look at how different things, and we look at the Ten Commandments, and, and the Ten Commandments was, was, was given to Israel. But at the same time, Paul even refers to that the moral law that is within us is, is the same. You know, we know that in, in a moral law or, or a conscious law, there are things that the Ten Commandments will uh, describe that it's just nature not to do. Now, I don't know why that, and, and I have my suspicions, and, and my suspicions of why the Ten Commandments were having to give to children of Israel is that they were coming out of 400 years of Egypt. So they didn't know who the one true God was. They had a memory of him. They had stories of him. They may have had him in, in Brother Mackey. Somebody made just a bedtime story. This is who Jehovah is. But yet they were immersed within the Egyptian society. So when they came out of Egypt, for all express purposes, they were Egyptian. They were made by birth. They were Israel. By, by culture, they were, they were Egyptian. They, they knew what they were. So there had to be a separation. And so when God pulled Israel out, he made a separation through law. He made a separation through commandments. He made a separation uh, through sacrifices. And he was separating them from the rest of the world. He wanted them to be different. He wanted them to be brought out. And so as Peter begins to realize that the same God that judged the Jews is the same God that's going to judge the Gentiles. And the same principles that the Jews would be uh, judged for is the same principles. We're judged by what we do. We're not judged by how many laws that we break, but we're judged by what we do in life. Do we do the right things for God? Or do we go against Him? Do we live a right life for Him? Or do we just live like the world and do whatever the world does? Have we separated ourselves from the world so that we're not like them, but we're following after Jesus? Or Jehovah. Same. One and the same. So what we're looking at here. So, and then if we drop down to verse 35, it says, But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is what? What? So do you mean that if I do what's right within him, I'm accepted of him? But yet we want to say we're not worthy of him. But he says, you're accepted if you're walking with me. 
But we say, well, I'm not worthy to know you are because his righteousness makes you accepted, which makes you worthy of what he has called you to do. He has called us to take this gospel. He has called us to take this world and to reach a lost and dying world. So he's calling us to be more than just sitting on a pew. He's calling us to be more than just coming in on a a Wednesday night. He's calling us to change your world. And so here, Peter is beginning to look at a different world. And we begin to see, and that word, it says that, that, uh, and the word which, 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by who? By Jesus Christ. The word I say ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good good and healing all that were oppressed of the devils for God was with him. And we are what? Witnesses. That's one of the greatest statements right there. He said, we were witnesses. It was not a second hand. It was not, they got it out. They didn't hear from uh, this one down the street. They said, we saw him raise the dead. We saw him break bread and feed the 5,000. We saw those that were healed. We were standing right there. We were standing I said it Sunday, and I'm going to say it again. I watched God move in a hospital room this this week. One more time, he spared my wife. One more time, he gave her back to me. Because we didn't know, she didn't even know she was coming back. We didn't know. But he's still answering prayer. And in the midst of all that, there was peace. No matter what was going on at that time, there was peace. She would come up and and she would get anxious and she said, let's just pray. And we would pray and you'd feel peace all over her. And he said, but it's the peace. So when we're beginning to understand that what the Holy Ghost does, it doesn't just bring us power, but it brings us peace in the midst of a storm. And here, Peter is about to open the doors for a a nation or for a people that the Jews had discounted. They didn't have nothing to do with them. We know that the vision that Cornelius had got. We know that the vision that Peter got. And and the the, the Lord told Peter, he said, there's three men at your door getting ready to knock. He said, don't ask questions, just go. And Peter and not Peter just didn't go, Brother Mackey. He said, "Coming in the house, it was, he was bringing Gentiles into a Jewish house." And then when he got over to Cornelius's house, he stepped right in. And in Cornelius's house, it wasn't just four or five people. You look at Cornelius had such a, uh, a, 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 a I wouldn't say following, but he had such an impression that he had people that either worked with him or worked under him. It wasn't just his immediate family. There may have been servants there. There may have been friends and acquaintances that he knew. This wasn't just a little table side Bible study. It was his whole household. And if you read and, and, and look into the, into the Greek, when they speak of household, they're speaking of a, wa- a broader Uh, a range of people that was part of that household. So it was something that was about to happen. And Caesarea became that point. And this really, if you want to look at it, this became the Gentile Pentecost. Because the first Pentecost was given to the Jews. And now they're moving into the Gentiles. And so it's opening up doors. What did they do from Jerusalem? After Pentecost, it moved out. When Caesarea, it began to move out through that, throughout the rest of the world. So when you begin to look at how God moved, He moved in so many different ways. But yet his purpose was what was one thing that he had done. It was to spread his gospel. Anybody tell me why 
that why the the gospel spread from Jerusalem. What was it? What was the driving force for the 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 gospel to be drove from Jerusalem? Persecution. This one was a persecution. Everybody went home. But then persecution came in. And they started getting pushed out. But Caesarea became a starting point that just went out throughout all of, of what was happening. And I began to look at this. And, and here we look at, at what Peter was understanding of the Gentiles. And as I was studying this, uh, one of the, uh, the, the books and the, the, the textbooks and the commentaries that I had referenced back to Romans chapter 10. And so, if you would, turn with me over to Romans chapter 10. At the 12th verse, and Paul is speaking to the Roman church. He said, for there is no difference between Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord... Over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And you go down to the next one. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I started really going back and studying this and, and looking within this. And, and if you'll go with me over to uh, the first verse of chapter 10 of Romans. What Paul began to do is the first eight chapters of Romans. He's speaking to the church. But chapter 9, 10, and 11, he's now speaking to Israel. He's taken a spot, and he's, he's stopped right here. And so now what Paul's doing, where Peter was preaching forward, Paul begins to preach backwards. Because he's trying to reach those of his own people that cannot see who Jesus is. It was easy, and really if you look at it and study, the, the main Jewish group that was saved in the Pentecost was what they were calling the Hellenistic Jews. It wasn't the old style. A lot of it was the newer generation. And so what they were, what they were looking at, they were embracing something that they really had not known. They understood what Judaism was, but they never experienced it, Brother Mackey. And you think about when Moses brought the children of Israel out, children of Israel out, the, the first generation that had turned away from God, they got out into Sinai, they, they, they began to make idols out there, they, they had lost their faith in God, and so what he had to do, that generation had to pass away, so the new generation who learned how to trust him could walk with him. So the old generation could not see who Jesus was. Paul even speaks that they were blinded. They were ignorant of him because they were stuck in the old ways. So now the new generation was saying, we see who he is. And so Paul began to speak here. He said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So he's beginning to say this, these, cha these chapters that we're looking at right now is he's trying to go back backwards and say if they could see who he is and so the second verse it says for I bear them record that they have zeal of God who better to know that than Paul if there was anybody that had a zeal for God it was Saul of Tarsus if there was anybody who was ready to throw the Christians in jail it was Saul of Tarsus he was going to fight for what he believed in and he wasn't going to let go but it took a road to Damascus and a light shining down upon him for him to realize who Jehovah was and he called his name Jesus because he's seen it with his own eyes his eyes were open his eyes might have been blinded but his spiritual eyes were opened on that road so here he's beginning, and he says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. How, was, how did the Jewish nation seek after their own righteousness? More and more laws. I, bet, I think there was only probably about 30 when they went into Babylon, and then there came out about another 630 more. 
But how were they getting their own righteousness? What were they having to do to obtain their own righteousness? Sacrifices. Obligations. If they sinned, they took a sacrifice. And, and even Jesus in, in the New Testament talks about overturning the tables because it got to a point that it was a business. They would go ahead and sell the, the, the sacrificed lambs or whatever, and they would sell them, take them to the priests, run them right back in and sell them again. They weren't doing the sacrifices. It just became a, 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 a ceremony. But yet that's how they were, ch- they were going after the righteousness of God. He said they were trying to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. How is Christ the end of the law? Come on. Because of the sacrifice. That sacrifice was made once and once it for all. So once you begin to come to the cross, I didn't have to come. I didn't have to have another sacrifice after that. With by faith, I'm able to establish it. I didn't have to go another year. When they would bring the sacrifice to uh, to the priest, all they were doing was pushing their sins away up a year. Now, when they come by faith and apply the blood of Jesus, the sins are washed away. They're remitted, and the remission is gone. So no longer am I rolling them away. I'm now getting rid of them. And it's all by faith, not by what I do, not by the sacrifice that I make or the sacrifice that I bring, but it's by applying the blood of the sacrifice that was on Calvary. So here, he's, he's talking, he said, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, for everyone that believeth. And he goes in, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, uh, that is to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, in, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which is preached. I don't have to try to go back and do it again because it's planted within my heart. Lord, I messed up today. I need to fix it today. I'm not just going to fix it so I can do it again. I want to change my direction. I want to move away from that. I'm struggling in this area. I need your help to move me. That's what repentance is all about. Repentance is not just saying, Lord, I'm sorry, but it's saying, I'm sorry, and I'm not going to do it again. And if I mess up again, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go right back, coach, and say, you've got to give me strength. I'm getting better. Just don't stop. Don't stop. Do it again. We all come short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. We all stumble. But that's where the blood of Jesus comes upon our lives. I don't have to go back and have him crucified again. All I've got to do is apply it. Let me stand in the oh. Let me stand in the shadow of the, of the cross. Let me stand in that crimson stream of blood. Let it go ahead and cover all over me one more time. Because no, I may not be worthy, but your blood makes me worthy to stand before you. Hebrews said, enter into the presence of God into the, with boldness. Not crawling, but just enter in because, Lord, you covers me. So Paul is really beginning to reach back, and he's trying to, to look at this. He said, uh, he said but, but what saith the word is nigh thee, even in the mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, that, sh- that shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He was speaking to Israel, because Israel could not see who he was. They could not see Jesus as king. 
They could not see Jesus as God. What they were seeing was a man. They could not grasp a hold of him. He's not speaking to the Gentile church right here. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. And he says, if you can just admit that he is Jehovah, you'll be saved. Because here, they, had, they were ignorant and they could not see For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If you were a Jew and you believed in Jesus, you had condemnation brought upon you. Oh, you're one of those. You're one that believes Jesus is God. How can you, think about this for a minute. How can you betray your heritage? By turning away from the one true God of Israel. That's what happened. Your family. We think our families get mad at us now. Whether you go to church or whatever. now, you know, it, These people were pushed away. Because now you became unclean. Because you were believing in another God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one God. So here, he's sitting here and said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have what? Not believed. They didn't believe in him, coach. So how could they call on him? Because they couldn't see who he was to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? There was a small number. I think Paul references 500 that was at the Mount Transfiguration, but only 120 of them made it to the upper room. 5,000 sat on a hillside and was fed by the Master, but only 120 of them made it to the upper room. 3,000 sat on a hillside and was fed by the Master, but only 120 of them made it to an upper room. Street. After street of people lying to see him, to touch him, to feel him, to get a blessing from him. But yet only 120 made it to the upper room. God has always had a remnant of a people that's going to be called by his name. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I said, did not Israel know? First, Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by the foolish nation, I will anger you. He's talking about us. Because we were grafted in. He said, I'm going to call a people that I never intended to call. And I'm going to pour my spirit into them. And I'm going to make you jealous because you missed it. Mm. Oh, that we stay plugged into the vine. Oh, that we stay plugged in to where he's at. But I said, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I'll provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by the foolish nation, I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifested unto them that asked not after me. Israel sought after God, but they didn't know who he was. And here in a household of Gentiles, he was found. Here in a household of Gentiles that should have by law been not allowed to even be in the presence of a Jew. And he was found there. But Israel, but to Israel he has said all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gangsaying people. So when we begin to understand 
that what happens is, is that at the end of the law, we know that it's Calvary. We know that it is through his blood and the sacrifice. But the end of the law for us is really the beginning. Because baptism, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and being infilled with the Holy Ghost is where we start. But the Jews, their ending and starting was right back there. So when they were baptized, if they were baptized in Jesus' name, they had fulfilled the law, and now the law was fulfilled within them because they had come to Calvary. So it was an ending point of the law for them, but it was a beginning for us. So we could see how that the blood flows backwards and the blood flows forward. That blood is always moving to be able to make a people that are not a people a people of God. It's His righteousness. It's not what I do. It's how I'm covered. Let me say it again. It's not how I do it, but it's how I'm covered. Let me be covered from the head to the toe. Peter looked at Jesus and he said, Oh, you can't wash me. Don't wash my feet. He said, Oh, I don't wash your feet. You can't be a part of me. He said, Oh, just do all of me. Lord, cover me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet with the blood of Jesus and let me stand in the gap for somebody. How want, I, we all have I said it. You know, we, we, mm, we want we talk about it. I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost that when I step into the rooms, the devils run. Because if I'm so full of the Holy Ghost, he don't want to come against you. If the Holy Ghost is moving in you, he doesn't want to mess with you because you're too strong. You might as well just go ahead and clear the room. But it's the weak ones that he's after. It's the ones sitting on the fence that he's after because they don't know the power of the Holy Ghost. They don't understand the power of the blood and they're not standing firm in who he is. A devil-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Mm. So Peter's standing here in the midst of Gentiles who is looking for a God. Let's, let's, just, let's just take just for a second. I, I, this is me, and I believe that there was uh, the Caesarean church was already established. And so what, what Cornelius was seeing was a God moving in the midst of a church. And he became hungry for what he'd seen, but he had no idea how to get a hold of it. This was still all new. So the Lord said, go get Peter. And Peter steps up and simply begins to preach. Just turn back to Acts. Thirty eight. For how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, with the power who went from doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, unto they slew and, and whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us. He said, I ran to the tomb and it was empty I was fearful and I went with everybody else into a locked room and while the doors were locked he stepped into the midst of a room he said I not only saw him crucified I saw him buried but I saw him alive he said this you can take to the bank can you see Cornelius a man who is seeking after God, he's sitting, he's listening to what Peter's saying. He said, you are an eyewitness. If this is a centurion, he doesn't jump to conclusions. What does he do? He goes, gets an eyewitness to a situation. So he's going, if you have seen this, then you uh, know what is going on. And he said, him, God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to the, all the people, but unto the witnesses chosen be of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he arose from the dead. Peter, you mean you ate and drank with him? It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't a theophany. It wasn't just a mirage. You sat and ate dinner with him. 
Not only that, I was so afraid I went fishing. And as I'm fishing, he's on the, on the seashore fixing fish, and he said, come and dine. He prepared a feast for them. He said, come and dine. Peter's reliving everything. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him all the prophets witnessed. And through his what? Name. His name. Mm. Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remissions of sin. This man was a centurion. He had been in battle. I'm sure there was many lives that he had taken. I'm sure there was many lives that he had destroyed. I'm sure there was guilt upon him. There was condemnation upon him. And in this little church in Caesarea, he was finding peace. Can you see the picture that if this was all his family, you know when one of your family members is in torment, you know when that one family member is hurting, because that one family member hurts, you hurt. Your whole family is affected by it. Can you see this whole household listening to Peter? And he begins to teach. And then he said, to him was given all the prophets, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. I can see Cornelius going, Lord, I need you. And suddenly... Cornelius' heart opened up in repentance. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out of the gift of the Holy Ghost. How, he, he goes and rehearses it. We'll talk, cover it next time. How do you know? Because we heard them speak. We heard it with our own ears. And when the Holy Ghost falls, everybody knows it. When God begins to move in a service, everybody, you're either going to get in and get a part of it, or you're going to get so uncomfortable you're going to want to leave. I've seen it. The Holy Ghost begins to move in a church service, and those begin to squirm a little bit. They want to get up, and they got to go get the bathroom. The mouth gets dry. They want to get a drink of water. They're trying to get out because the Word of God is convicting them, and the Spirit of God is moving through them. That whole household began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And they of the circumcision, which believe, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak speak with tongues and magnified God then answered Peter mm, can any man forbid water that there, these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost Brother Mackey as we have this is our Pentecost we, could trans we can go back to Cornelius' house and say, this is where the Gentiles Pentecost. From there, you can go back to Acts 2.38 because this is where it came from. But this is the door that opened for you and I today. For whosoever will. He said, unto you and those that are far off, strangers. Peter in this chapter referred back to Joel. And in Acts chapter 2, he referred back to Joel. He said, this is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel. He said, this is what's going on. So if the, the Holy Ghost and, and baptism in Jesus' name, I've heard it where, well, the, whole, the Acts 2.38 was just for the disciples there. Well, how do you explain Cornelius? If it was just for the apostles so that they could do their work, how do you explain Cornelius' house? Because it was brought out. And from that point, Caesarea became a stop or a pushing point. Caesarea was a main metropolis. And everybody went through Caesarea. If you were going to travel out of, out of Israel and out to Italy or wherever, you had to go through Caesarea. 
you had to stop, go through a town that was on fire. And there was a church with a man called Philip, a man called Peter. Paul came through there. Paul preached in there. God moved so much. It was the nucleus of the Gentile movement of God. And to think that each church today can have the exact same effect on our community. If we treated our church as a Caesarean church to where we're going out and reaching everybody out there and going by and getting those that we know, getting our acquaintances in, and get them to the, to the church. I may not have all the answers, but if I can get them here and get them in the presence of God, God will begin to reveal it to them. I can't draw anybody here, but it's the Spirit of God that draws them. But it's by the word of your testimony. It's by your witness. It's by what we've got to be prepared for. If you'll turn with me. Back over to Romans. Chapter 11. The 25th and the 26th verse. He's still talking to Israel. He's talking about the remnant. And their future future. Uh, restoration of Israel in fact I'm going to st- I'm going to go back up to the 17th verse it said if some of the branches be broken off and thou being a wild olive tree worth grafted in among them and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree boast not against those branches he's talking now he's talking to the church he said look you were grafted in mm. Well, coach, yeah, you, you don't have what I have. You're Jew. You, you don't understand what I have. But yet it was on the same way. Jews are going to wait a minute. But you're so far off, you don't understand where you come from. So here, he's, Paul's going, they're going to come against you. They're going, to, they're going to persecute you. They're going to come and say, you're not walking with God right. But don't go back against them. When the enemy comes against you, you don't go back after him. Let the Spirit of God move. That's why I said, if I'm so full of the Holy Ghost, when he comes in, the Holy Ghost is going to take care of it. I'm just going to have to be who I am and let God be who he is. And he began to teach, and he said, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boastest, do boast not the root, but the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt save them. The branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. He was saying, look, just because Israel was cut off for a moment doesn't make you any special. It just means you've been grafted into the vine. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Now he's talking of Israel. Thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, who? Israel. Take heed, lest he also spare not thee. He said, hey, hey, we can't go against them because we could get cut off too. Be careful. Be careful. Of what's happening. Hang on to what you've got. Before therefore the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell. But toward the goodness if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also if they abide not still in unbelief shall be grafted in. But God is able to graft them in again. He said if they turn to me I can put them right back into the vine. He said I can graft them right back in. He's looking for a repentant heart. He's looking for a heart that's seeking after him. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. For if thou wert cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? He said, there's going to come a day that I'm going to bring Israel back in, and I'm going to graft him back into the vine. But right now, he's cut off, because I'm going to show you here and here, 
just a second. It said, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye would be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. They can't see who he is. They don't recognize who he is. Until what? Until the fullness of the Gentiles. You know what we need to be doing? We see, we see these, these placards all over. Stand with Israel. Go ahead, stand with Israel. But get somebody saved. Get somebody filled with the Holy Ghost. Get somebody covered with the blood. You want to stand with Israel? Let's get the last Gentile in. And then let him go back to Israel. Because at that point, we're gone. The only thing that's holding back the hand of, of God right now is the church praying. Until the last Gentile. And the also Israel shall be saved as it is written. Thou shalt come out of Zion the deliverer. Ooh. And his name shall be what? Jesus. He's anointed me to preach the gospel. To set at liberty those that are held captive. Mm. If there was not a deliverer in the name of Jesus, we wouldn't be sitting here today. How many has been delivered of something because of the name of Jesus? He said there's going to be a deliverer come out of Zion and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. Go with me to Romans 14, 17. And 18. Can you see the plea of, of, of Paul going backwards? Paul, at one point, he said, I'd give this all up, Brother Mackey, if my brethren would be saved. I would lose my salvation if I can save my people. What a sacrifice to say, I would give it all up if they could be saved. Romans 14, 17. And 18, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, joy, and what? Mm, 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 mm. So with the Holy Ghost, I've got joy. With the Holy Ghost, Sister Lauren, you've got peace that passes all. Understanding in the Holy Ghost, mm, 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 mm. for he that is these things serveth Christ is what acceptable to God and approved of men. Fifteen, verse thirteen. Now the God of hope. Fill you with all joy, peace, and believing that ye may abound in what? Hope. Through the power of what? The Holy Ghost. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sin in the name of Jesus Christ, and ye shall receive peace, joy, love, power, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you're looking for peace, it's His Spirit. It all, he looked at Nicodemus. Nicodemus, to enter into the kingdom of God, you've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. The water cleanses me, but the Spirit gives me life. Life eternal, life everlasting. One more in closing. Hebrews chapter 2. We know that Paul is writing Hebrews. And he's writing Hebrews to who? Hebrews. Therefore, starting at verse 1, chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have, what? heard, lest at any time we should let them, what? Don't let go of the foundation that has been poured into your life. 
don't let go of the foundation of the word of God that has been brought here. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a recompense of reward. He said, if you're living by the law, he said, you're going to have to face this. He said, there's going to be a recompense of a reward for the disobedience. How shall we then escape? Because without him, without his spirit, without his baptism, I can't escape judgment. I can't escape the sin because I haven't applied the sacrifice and I haven't applied the blood. He said, how shall we escape if we neglect? Everybody say neglect. So great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. We heard him firsthand. We've seen Peter. We've seen the, uh, Stephen. We've seen all of the, the John. We've seen all the disciples, all the apostles. He said, this is not something, this is not a man's fable. We didn't just make this up. We saw this. Paul can say, I saw him on a road to Damascus. I felt him in my heart. I felt and watched. I've seen miracles after miracles. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape? Cornelius opened the door that we could escape. Because he's, he opened the door for salvation to a people that was not a people. But now we are a people. We are a remnant of the name of Jesus. We are a remnant of that. I've got to, at the best of my abilities, and my abilities sometimes are not what they need to be, but I've got to live by this. But I've got an escape because of what he did on the cross for you and for me. He said, just realize who he is. He's not a Sunday school story. He's not just something we do on Easter. It's not something that we just, we, we, we celebrate on Christmas. He's forever. And he wants to change your hearts. Change your spirit. Change your soul. Just hang on to that, what you have been told. Let's stand. Thank you, Brother Bledsoe. Let's give him a hand tonight. He covered a lot of ground right there, but I would like to go back and cover it because he covered a very profound point that I don't ever want you to forget, and I don't want you to miss this. He covered a lot, and I know, I mean, that's, but I want you to get this point right here. If you, and there's a lot, a lot of takeaways from tonight's message. But here is one that I really want you to revisit in your mind. Write it down, put it in your phone, whatever you got to do. A Probably one of the most profound misunderstandings in the Scripture. Matter of fact, I believe it is the most profound misunderstanding in the Scripture. Paul, and, and this is where denominal churches get it wrong. And, and that's just all I can say. You can say, hey, don't run down anybody's church, but they got this wrong. Okay? They got this wrong, and there's nothing wrong with being wrong unless you don't make it right. And here's an opportunity for you to witness to those people, those folks who are believers, but need to get something right. Okay? Paul was, he was a citizen of two different nations. And he was writing to a church. Okay, I want you to understand, whenever he was writing the book of Romans, he was writing to the church at Rome. Okay, he was writing to, in Rome, the last time I checked, was in Italy. Okay, and Italians are Europeans. They are not Jews. Okay, these are Gentiles. He's writing to a bunch of Gentiles in Italy. All right, saying, and, and of course, there's the Hebrews. There's the church uh, in Jerusalem, 
Okay, and, and that's also a church. But he's writing to a church about a nation. And Paul was a citizen of Rome. He was a Roman citizen. And he was a Jewish citizen. He was the citizen of both of these worlds. And he was writing to the church at Rome saying, if the nation that I'm a part of, if the Hebrew nation, if the Jewish nation would only come to the knowledge, if they could only get past their uh, orthodoxy, and they could only come to the knowledge of who Jesus is, if they could believe in their heart like we do, and confess with their mouth like we do, then they would be saved. Paul was not writing the plan of salvation. Let me say that again. Paul did not create or come up with a new plan of salvation. Almost every denomination will take you to Romans. When you ask them, how can I be saved? They'll take you to Romans. But all of these churches that existed, the church that he was writing to, had already been saved. How were they saved? This book was not written until 39 years after Christ ascended. How were they saved? And put that back up that, that he read in Hebrews. You got that? Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest that at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every a transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The salvation that he was talking about, the salvation that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about, was the blood covenant with Jesus Christ in the keys that he gave Peter. And to say that, men and brethren, what shall we do? You should do the same thing that the church at Rome did. Repent of your sins. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. And receive the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Just like Cornelius did. And how did they know that they had received the Holy Ghost? How did those Jews, those Hebrews standing around, know that Cornelius and his household full of Gentiles received it? Because they heard them speaking in other tongues just like they did. And so, in that 39-year gap, people were saved somehow. Before the book of Romans was ever written, they were saved somehow. And they were saved the same way that they were saved the same way that they were on the day of Pentecost. And so that is something that is a profound. He's talking to Rome about Israel. He's talking to the church at Rome about the nation of Israel right there. And that is one of the most profound things. He's not talking to the church of Rome about how to be saved. He's not trying to teach them how to be saved. They've already been saved. Okay? He's not telling them anything new. He's just saying if Israel believed like we do, that in that prayer still has not been answered. That prayer, he, he, I'm going to read it to you right here, and I'm going to dismiss. But it says right here, chapter 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire, brethren, and he's talking to the Romans, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he's talking about the nation. And that prayer is in the process of being fulfilled. That prayer in that prophecy, and he went on to say later in the chapter, they're going to be saved. God is going to deal with them again, and he will. And you see all kinds of Messianic Jews starting to step forward and fulfill that prophecy and to fulfill, answer that prayer that Paul prayed. But you got to understand, you got to put it in context. That's the reason that it is so important to listen to messages like this, is not just to take out of context a, a couple of scriptures and base your entire faith on it. You got to put it in context. What happened when? And the fact is, the salvation he was referring to, he was not, it was not a revelation 
the revelation of his salvation came on the road to Damascus. And it had already come to probably hundreds of thousands of Christians already when it came to Paul. Maybe millions. Who knows? All right, so very good message tonight. God bless you for being here tonight. And uh, let's, let's dismiss in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for the word that has come forward tonight. Thank you for another ta- opportunity to come into your house and to worship you and learn more about you. Pray, Lord God, tonight that this message would not just stop at these walls, but this message would go out into the highways, into the byways, into our community, into our city, so that more people might receive the truth of your salvation, of that great salvation that you died to provide for us. We're just so very thankful that we know that truth. Now, we ask you, Lord God, that you would instill within us the power and the desire to be witnesses unto you in Bryant, Arkansas, in Benton, Arkansas, wherever we go to be witnesses unto this great salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you on Sunday.